Hey, Christian got back from Turkey, but he's unavailable right now. But he says he's got some, he's got some stories to tell. I and bet I he does. I don't know if those stories will be online or or offline. If he <laughs> got it, inter interesting to interesting to hear. All right, well let's let's jump in. You got uh, volleyball okay. duty. Volleyball duty, soccer duty, all kinds of duty. Yeah, who's playing volleyball, Ashley? Actually, I think she's built for it. Yeah, she is. That's what's, that was my guess. Yeah. Long and tall. Very good. All right. Well, we're pressing into uh, chap chapter five in Galatians. Well, I guess that uh, the key is freedom. That's the that's the you know the essential theme. I guess is the word. And he's really going to begin to kind of play out the difference ah, freedom makes, or what or what freedom looks like. Freedom is what's threatened with the folks in James as you, uh, you know, unpacked the text just prior at the end of chapter four, the children of promise are free, the children of the slave woman and all of that. So, so give us a summary of, uh, of the sermon Sunday, just to, yeah, just as a bridge to the beginning of chapter five. Mm. Uh, well, I, you know, as I, as I got in that chapter, I just using the language that we had there with the, Paul contrasting Hagar and Sarah, um, the children, the son of a slave or the children of a slave and the child or son of promise. And that enslavement idea, I guess, as we, we kind of really is when we were talking last week over the podcast, I just kept hearing echoes of, you know, that Genesis three, kind of the, the will to power. Hey, you don't really need to listen. Hey, you don't really need to stay away from what you're told to stay from. You can seize the knowledge of good and evil, you know, and then just every temptation throughout the biblical story that follows is, is that do you choose to trust or do you choose to grab hold of power here? And as I saw Paul laying out those decisions, you know, the, the child of promise versus the child of slave, it's, it's that inclination of our flesh to grab a hold of power that ironically enslaves us right i mean we think of it as freedom well this is where we're going today we think of it as freedom and it's the opposite thereof um you know and but that's always sin's allure is hey do what you want do what you think is best follow your will wishes desire whatever it is and then we become captive to those disordered desires um so those are the two the kind of the the big poles were promise, which, you know, really is characterized by our trust in him versus power, which is us, you know, ignoring him and, and laying hold of power ourselves. Um, which, you know, I think we see all over the text and all over Galatians, but pretty easy to see it all over our world right now, especially within the church. And I think you focused my attention at the end of last week, you know, you said the, the question is, what is the word of the church today to throw out the son of the slave, you know, and, and where are we um, enmeshing ourselves? And for me, it, it's just that it's, it's the, the will to power. And, uh, you know, we got to grab a hold of the right levers and we got to pass the right laws. We got to get the right people in place. We got to stand up for our rights here and here and here. And we're just doing things that are so antithetical to really just the way of way of Jesus. And so, you know, as I got into the Galatians, I'm just hearing, I'm hearing echoes of the Genesis and, you know, and I'm thinking Moses and I'm thinking Abraham and I'm thinking David. But then as I'm hearing what Paul's saying as a child of promise, I just keep hearing, and especially in that Isaiah passage, um, the poem, you know, that's, that's just, that's just a, a foreshadowing of the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And, you know, just the way of Jesus, it's so utterly different from a world that insists on power and violence and oppression and, you know, throwing your weight around to get what you want or what you think you need, or sadly, you, even what you think is best for the church. Uh, you yeah, know, I think we're experiencing a lot of that right now. And then the link for me was, um, you know, how, because, you know, I, I actually kind of thought I was done. Like, well, that's it. That's the message. You know, it's, this choice between power and promise. Uh, and I think I was there by 
you know, Friday morning. But you know how this is. You should never try to finish your sermon early because the Lord keeps working on you. <laughs> and I thought, well, how do, how do we get there? You know, you know, and and for me, probably with Good Friday, you know, still in my ears, the way is is through the, you know, following the passion of Christ and dying to self, because it's the self that wants to lay hold of power. And, 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 and you know, you might think, well, I'm not a person that seeks power, but, you know, I think for all, it could be affirmation, it could be attention, it could be you know, all kinds of ways where we, we receive our, our identity and our direction from the world around us rather from the Lord, you know, so that just surrendering our will to his over and over that dying to self. And I, and I, and I mentioned this morning, you know, uh, I describe it as, as the path of descent that none of us really want to contemplate, but that is, you know, it and I think especially for and I have to you know and that's why you always wish there's more time to nuance I think I think the path of descent is a word for uh, the white and evangelical church has enjoyed a lot of power influence for a long time it might be feeling some of it slip away and so now we're fighting hard um, there's a path of ascent for you know Christians who have been nominalized and marginalized and persecuted probably in all other parts of the world. Maybe those are some of the stories we'll hear from Christian when he returns from Turkey or, you know, stories we can hear from the church in China or, you know, places where there is an ascendancy, um, but it's born of persecution. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, just, just that, that embracing that it's it, in one sense surrender, but really it's it's trust. It's stepping into trust and trusting the promise God has made. That he'll the battle is his, the history is his, uh, and we don't have to lay hold of worldly mechanisms to to bring the kingdom about. Although we're called to live into and participate in the kingdom. Uh, so yeah, that's that's where I was. I mean, you said what I heard you say, and you said it a few times. And you may have had it on, on the PowerPoint, but you, you were contrasting presence and power. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, the presence of the Lord or grabbing hold of, you know, worldly power, which, you know, I was just hearing pushes the Lord out. Yeah. No, the pre yeah, absolutely. The presence is, is, is the key to the promise. Because promise could be a, a, a sent to a mental idea. Presence is where you say, because I'm with the Lord, I'm just not going to participate in this present evil age in that way. I'm going to, you know, participate in the kingdom in a different way. But right, yeah, that's I all think, rooted in presence. Yeah. So yeah. So so I had that kind of resonating as I was thinking through Galatians five one through six, and just seeing the Lord's presence and the difference that makes in uh you know in in the individual and of course in the community uh yeah, there you go yeah. so that's that's going to be echoing at least in my head as we as we talk through this um so let's pray and uh and we'll uh, see what the lord has so lord we do thank you for the blessing of, of your scripture again and and uh walking deliberately through reading closely slowly with an ear to to your living voice, your presence among us, Lord, that we might hear what you would um, have us hear for for today. So, Lord, so we do thank you that you are with us in your word and and, and by your spirit, and just ask that you would uh, lead us. Amen. 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 Hey, it was real timely at the elders meeting when you uh, direct, directed us to Brett Stevens' uh, article in the New York Times. Why we article. Yeah, why we admire Zelensky. Do you have the notes there in front of you? Could, uh, can I do. You, can you want me to read that excerpt? Yeah, read that excerpt because, I mean, it really does. Now, Zelensky is a, you know, he's a secular Jew, I think. But Brett Stevens is is get, getting a hold of something that I think is helpful for us. Go ahead. Yeah. Why do we admire Volodymyr Zelensky? The question almost answers itself. We admire him because in the face of unequal odds, Ukraine's president stands his ground. 
because he proves the truth of the adage that one man with courage makes a majority, because he shows that honor and love of country are virtues we forsake at our peril, because he grasps the power of personal example and physical presence, because he knows how words can inspire deeds, give shape and purpose to them, so that the deeds may in turn vindicate the meaning of the words. In contrast, Putin stands for the idea that truth exists to serve power, not the other way around, and that politics is in the business of manufacturing propaganda for those who will swallow it and imposing terror on those who will not. Ultimately, the aim of this idea isn't the mere acquisition of power or territory. It's the eradication of conscience. Man, and, and what I like about that I don't know Brett Stevens' spiritual commitments, you know, at all. I know he he, he kind of comes from the conservative side of, of things. But when he talks about, you know, words that inspire deeds and then deeds that vindicate, you know, the meaning of words, boy, I, that's just a tremendous summary of our, uh, of our lives as embodied uh, spiritual beings. Mm-hmm. You know, words, of course, kind of lean towards the spiritual, immaterial side of things, but then the deeds in the real world. You know, that's, boy, yeah. that, that is what it means to be a human being. And even the line about above that, because he grasps the power of personal example and physical presence, and we're just talking about presence, I think one of the first things that was the real, you know, aha for a lot of the world was Zelensky is when he said, I don't need a ride, you know, I need ammo. And you realize, He's staying right there. He is not leaving, you know, and he hasn't left yet, right? But just that I'm present. If nothing else, I'm staying here. Putting your money where your mouth is stuff. Yeah. And 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 it leaps. It leaps from the from the wah 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 of of what is everywhere, you know, that's just mm-hmm. in the media because it's it's the it's concrete, it's real. And Stevens recognizes that what Putin's got to do is, is, you know, the eradication of conscience, because as as embodied spiritual beings, it's the conscience, you know, it's that place of of moral knowing, you know, self-awareness and discernment where the where the linkage of uh, what I know to be true. That needs to be acted on or i can't live with myself that's mm-hmm. conscience and and to weaken the conscience or, or the damage the conscience is to create enfeebled enslaved people mm-hmm. and that's yeah. and stevens is putting his finger right on that and so as right. we talk about the presence of the lord bringing true freedom and true kingdom power it's right there at the place of conscience where the Holy Spirit, you know, is in dialogue with our spirit that, you know, mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that gets empowered. And I think that's where Paul's going in these next six verses right there. Yeah, that's good. There's a, you know, there's a practical argument be made for politics, you know, that we're not electing pastors or priests or, you know, however you want to put that, but, but that conscious level gets at something else. Like does does pulling a lever sear your conscience? I think that question's been brought home to me uh, in recent history. Yeah. Just leave it at that. Well, and and it goes back to the 1990s critique of political leadership, where where character is critical in right. in, in our leaders, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's read the text, and we'll just uh, we'll just walk through it and see what the Lord has to say. Why don't you go ahead and grab it? All right, Galatians 5, 1 through 6. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. 
For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. So the opportunity is to crawl into that first century world, hear the words as they were understood when Paul originally expressed them. You know, there's a lot of evangelical ease in this in this language that we want to be real, real careful not to race to embrace uh, thinking we know what they mean. And let's just slow down and (laughs) hear these words. Loaded terminology for us, right? Freedom. Yeah, well, that is exactly precisely. And so that's where we that's where we begin for freedom. Christ has set us free. Now, the first thing to acknowledge <laughs> in, as Paul's expressing that is, is freedom uh, absolutely depends upon the spirit in our midst. It's nothing we, yeah, his presence, absolutely. Nothing we fight for, nothing, it's, it, is, it is the spirit's presence. So 2 Corinthians 3.17, uh, just, just a clear statement. Uh, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's helpful. Great Fourth of of July, (laughs) Bert. There you go. (laughs) And then in Galatians 4, 6, and 7, Paul kind of says it and turn it inside out. He he, he uses the negative imagery of slavery, but uh, Paul writes, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Mm-hmm. So with the spirit's presence, we cry, Abba, Father, no longer a slave, but a son, which he develops in last week's text with Hagar and Sarai and all of that stuff. All that. All right. So as we were kind of making fun as americans we <laughs> we hear the word freedom in one frame so you gotta ask the question how might how might paul think about you know that that frame and anytime and we've talked about this before if paul uses bondage or slavery or deliverance or freedom language he's going right back to egypt mm-hmm. that is the that is the frame. And of course, um, and that's, you know, and, and that's against the friend that his contemporary frame that he was pushing back against was that Jewish nationalism. I mean, you could hear the variety of rebellions broiling in Jerusalem underneath Roman oppression and, and freedom mm-hmm. language being, you know, thrown out against the Roman oppressor and and James's people tying circumcision to this sense of Jewish identity and you know you you know you can hear that that right. Paul has a deeper intent here. Now we can take a moment and think about push back against the American frame of freedom that we carry, right? Right. And I, and I identified three and, and first of course is the is the is a sense of you know freedom of 1776 the the don't tread on me stuff uh, american mm-hmm. independence you know our own american nationalism all of that and that's kind of a yeah kind of that taps into the other uh, biblical notion but we do, we we, we want to go for, far further than that you know we got the the whole libertarian wing of the country every every person ought to be free to do what is right as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Right. But don't bother me, don't bother you, or whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That bit. And and the, and and then the other one is is the whole radical expressive subjectivism where I must be free to be what I feel myself to be. And that opens up it, you know, into the whole, well, primarily because of the intensity of, you know, the feeling component of a sexuality, you know, from 
you know, adultery being frowned upon, but accepted the whole gay agenda and then transgenderism and all, all that, all that stuff The you know, this notion of freedom as the expressing what I'm feeling as my authentic self. And I really think the dominant culture has really come to think of freedom in even more than the libertarian or the kind of patriotic nationalism or or maybe that's where the battle lines are drawn, a more traditional notion and this more radical subjective notion. Right. Yeah, I think that's where the, the two collide is along those those kind of fractured lines, right? Yep. And really anybody reading the Bible from one of those two camps can grab it and run with it, you know, and just grab the scripture, you know, for, for, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So don't tell me what to do or for freedom, Christ has set me free. And I, and I feel like I'm really a woman, you know, don't tell me I'm not. Well, right. And now at least it's founded on scripture. (laughs) <laughs> exactly right? i mean that's kind of i mean we, that's a trap we've built for ourselves yeah i can proof text it that's um, right yeah yeah, yeah. And i know i know we could unwire that bomb but still that's the, the knee-jerk reaction anyway i got a verse for it yep and so the opportunity is to take a step back and say well well maybe but what does the bible what do you think the Bible has to say about that? How, how would the Bible define that term? I think that really you know, brings up two of our favorite things is, is one, reading narratively, right? Because it's just plucking those verses out to make them do what you want them to do. And then two, the presence of the, the Spirit. And maybe a third component would be the, uh, the, the, uh, the community that, that checks that, that, that realizes, ah, you know, that might not be a word from the Lord. That verse might not be saying what you think you're, it's saying. And so, yeah, so and all those things are under some form of duress, you know, reading well, uh, community, and practicing the presence. I mean, those are all very real challenges within the church. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. So let's go to Exodus 19, 4 through 6. Uh mm-hmm. Go there and read it. So this is where the Hebrews meet with God on Mount Sinai, uh, and the and the you know this is the making of the covenant. So you know, some folks call this the constitution of the nation of Israel. It kind of it all be, begins here after the deliverance from bondage to Egypt to set up their their way of being with the Lord as a people. So go ahead, four through six. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey Shema, my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be a treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay, it speaks to, for me, it's that, that passage speaks to two powerful things, right? It speaks to God's purpose for God delivering them out of Egypt, that they might be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, which Peter embraces for the church in 1 Peter chapter 2, quoting this mm-hmm. passage directly. Yeah. And then you have, and, and the second thing is this whole idea of, and this is my pet peeve in translation. Familiar translations say, if you will indeed obey my voice, say something like hearken to, to my voice, and, and you and you express the what the Hebrew word there, the Shema, if you will hear my voice. And 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 that whole dynamic is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's presence, the, the whole idea of mm. hearing the voice of God. I think that's that's one of the ways that that the Old Testament conveys the Spirit's activity among God's people. If you will hear my voice, and I fold back that that back into Brett Stevens' article 
why do why we admire Zelensky? You know, that's because it's that it's hearing the Lord in the conscience. You know, yeah. slicing through the delusions and the deceptions and the distortions, helping us re really get a grip on what's true. You know, the the ability to discern right. what he would have, which only comes, and this is the key point, as we hear his voice, which is to say, in the presence of his spirit. Mm. Right. And in our post enlightenment burden, when you read the Bible for ideas, rather than reading the Bible for his presence, <laughs> we, you know, we can go in off in all kinds of different directions, validating whatever I want to have validated. Sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm I'm just ripping the language out of the scripture, you know, these ideas that I think I understand where we're really got to, I really got to get to that place of being open to his presence, really learning to hear his voice, to Shema, right? So he can really form uh, my conscience and empower my embodied response, which makes Jesus visible in the world, see? Yeah, yeah. And a word for that, and that leads to freedom. That's See, that's what I think Paul means when he said, you know, for freedom, Christ is set us free, to, to experience that whole, that dynamic that he intended mm -hmm. coming out of, of Egypt. Of course, another way, and the shorthand, and, and another shorthand, I think is faith. Why, why, why Paul is so energized by the faith law dynamic in his letter, because he recognizes that embracing the forms of ancient Judaism keeps speaker keeps people anchored in the present evil age where God isn't present. Mm. And that's the danger because that's the familiar way of being in the world. And of course, in the kingdom age, God is present by his mm -hmm. spirit. And then to learn, you know, for the Lord to disciple us to that constant awareness of his presence by his spirit. See, that's the, that's the deal. That's sure. what I'm, that's what I'm understanding Paul's saying here. Say that the, the type of freedom there, this is, um, that's rooted in presence. It's this Exodus moment, right? That re, that clarifies it. But that that would be the same freedom in the garden, right? Where God is present with His people. Um, and there's important contrast there with those other kind of you know. It's not libertarian freedom. It's not nationalist freedom. It's not progressive freedom. It's freedom in the presence of God to uh, be fruitful and multiply, right? Um, and and the same type of freedom that we see in Revelation, where where every knee will bow. And so there's a, I guess there's an authority structure there that we would think, well, that. That's not, you know, certainly not libertarian or, I mean, again, it falls short of those other lenses, but it's freedom in the presence of our creator. Well, going back to Genesis 3, right, that uh, the whole force of that narrative is whose voice are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the mm. voice of the snake or are you going to listen to the voice of the Lord and the lure of the snake? is you will if here is the snake's voice you will be like god knowing good and evil so you don't need to listen to the voice of the lord which means i have just dethroned god out of creation and put myself there right in this in this autonomy yeah yeah and 
God's presence. I've pushed God out of the way. And now I'm living out of my sense of self. And when you're living out of your sense of self and your sense of self doesn't kowtow to my sense of self, I get a gun and put it to your head to com to compel your, you know, that you will bow, you know, that your knee shall bow to me. But when every knee shall bow to, uh, to Jesus, right, that's that willing acknowledgement of his rightful role as, uh, well, authoritative, not in the sense of gun to the head, but the sense of, you know, Jesus knows what he's talking about. I've really come to the place to realize I really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. So I'm really going to shut my mouth and listen to him. Yeah. So there's a, uh, this is a listening tip, um, a side, a side B deep cut takes a minute to go, but if you listen to the Bridgetown podcast at a Bridgetown church in Portland, there is a Friday night lecture by the Bible Project's Tim Mackey. So listeners will have to backtrack. Go to the Bridgetown podcast and then find the Friday night lecture by Tim Mackey. And he um, walks through Job, unpacks Job. And um, he, and what, what made me think of it is he boils the whole story down to, he says there's really only one, one theme in the Bible, and it's, who are we listening to? Are we listening to God or are we listening to the snake? And there's language that, that lights that up for us. So um, whenever someone's referred to as a holy or a righteous one, you know, there's this possibility. Is this the one? Is this the one that's going to get it right? You know, so is it Adam? No. no. Is it Mo you know, Abraham? No. no. Is it Moses? No, no. And so Job, who is introduced as God's holy and righteous servant. And, and what is he do he he listens you know to god and not the snake um but of course the you know the counselors and all of that right right, right. but what but just what you're saying is it's it's and and naki says it's like a uh i've listened to these albums but it's like a blue note jazz era album where there's one melody it gets played in the first line, you know, in the first stanza of the, the song. And then it's deconstructed and replayed from different angles and different instruments all over the, the rest of the song. So you hear the whole song in the first 15 seconds, but then the jazz song turns out to be 13 minute song. And he uses that analogy for how the Bible works. Like you get it all in the first few pages. Who, whose voice are you listening to? And then it's just replayed and replayed and replayed. So it's interesting listen that picks up on exactly what you're just talking about well and there and just a, and the real value of that i mean and that and that image of the jazz you you learn to hear that theme through scripture you'll be able to he, recognize that theme in our own lives yeah there you go yeah that's good it, you, you know oh that is familiar oh boy this is way too familiar <laughs> i've heard yeah. this song before yeah yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, so let's okay, so let's 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 go to uh, 5 2 through 4. So f for freedom Christ has set us free. And in in 2 through 4 Paul is is laying out not presence but separation, distance. You know, the contrast. And then in five and six, he's going to bring back, you know, this whole quality of presence. So what? Yeah, two go, through four. Yeah, two through four. Look, I, Paul, to you say that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts cir circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Now what really resonates in the contemporary evangelical church is the is the reformation themes of of justification as the courtroom um get get out of jail free stuff mm -hmm. um, which is kind of yeah kinda 
But I think what Paul is communicating more directly is the reality of Jesus' presence by his spirit that is lost. See, it's not so like, you mean I lose the forgiveness, you know, the stamp of God of forgiveness? I, I lose my get out of jail free card? Nah, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about losing presence. Okay. So in, so, so, so in 5.2, uh, Christ would be of no uh, advantage to you. And, and, and really that, that word there is, is idea of, of help. Well, you know, you know, in, in, in our time of need, uh, he, he won't be present to help us to get us out of all the ways that we're entangled in the foolishness of, you know, the worldly patterns and false ideas and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, because when because I, you're just keeping the checklist, you're not entering into relationship. Uh, right. Yeah. That's, the, that's why the law stands in opposition to the presence because I can do it automatically. I can do it out of will and discipline. Well, even even more than that, you know, think of the um, the momentum of a thousand years of Jewish identity markers: separation from Gentiles, circumcision, kosher foods, deeply anchored in this present. You know, to to protect God's people from the present evil age, and so especially in that first century for those guys to to listen to James's people to be circumcised is to is to root themselves in that in the in in the uh, the gravitas of that way of being in the world rather than being aware of Jesus's presence by his spirit that's the most important thing. I need to learn to attend to the Spirit's presence. The, the momentum of doing these things that mark you as God's people, if that's where my attention is, my attention isn't going to be to attending to the Spirit's presence. It's, inter it's interesting. I mean, you can kind of, as you praise, you know, a thousand years of momentum behind it. You, you, you can think of it empathetically. You think like, yeah, these guys, it's just a lot to unwind. Um, although Paul's not that, I mean, Paul's pretty tough. He's not coddling him here in there. Yeah. Come along guys. But then you also think, I mean, that's, it's the same force that Jesus encountered with the Pharisees, right? They're, they're in that place where they're not recognizing him or the spirits work in him um, because they're just fixated on this, this other, these boundary lines. That's the, that's the dramatic force of the line in John's prologue. He came to his own and his own received him not, right? That's a, sh you know, you would think they would recognize him, but their attention was elsewhere, right? There, you know, they uh, they were they they were focused on elements of the of the law, and they were so focused on you know it's missing the forest for the trees. Yeah, simple thing. So so God shows up in the flesh in Jesus. They weren't expecting it. God God wouldn't do that. You know all that stuff and. And they missed the the intensity of God's steadfast love and faithfulness in the person of Jesus. Yeah. And 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 so you can see, yeah, that's and and we we gotta pre I mean we we talk about conversion and spiritual formation. We gotta appreciate there's all kinds of stuff that we attend to that is not the spirit of the Lord. <laughs> sure. yeah. you know, we don't need to beat up those guys. You know, it's like, boy, there's all kinds of stuff that that we would prefer to go to, you know, that we've right. learned to go to either in the church or outside the church. So this is a real deal.
we focus on those things, we become insensitive to Christ's presence and he's not going to be able to help you. See? And then I think in verse 3, is I, I think is kind of rhetorical flourish. Uh, you know, uh, when he says, I testify. I testify again to every man who accepts him that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Yeah. And you know as well as I did, you guys haven't done a good job doing that, <laughs> you know, in the, in the full light of day, right? So he's stating an impossibility there. Like, good luck with that, if that's really what you want. Yeah, yep. Okay. And then we flow in to uh, verse 4. You are severed from Christ. NIV translates the words severed as alienated. Uh, the Lexham Bible um, translate estranged from Christ. So, and, I, and I like those translations better than severed. Severed feels kind of mechanical, you know, cut the arm off. But estranged, alienated, you know, that's... In the that's, context of relationship, a relationship that's been ignored or... Yeah, walk, to. exactly. Walking away from his presence, see, walking into into this present evil age with the momentum of that way of being in the world, right? You're, you're, you're distancing yourself from the Lord's presence. And then 5-4, at the second half of verse 4, you've fallen away from grace. Mm. Now, got to stop there because most people hear the word grace as God's riches at Christ's expense, right? That's the old acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. Um, as you know, and again, that's how you get the jet, jet, get, get out of jail free card. And it's as if um, you've fallen away from, you know, can you lose your salvation, right? That's how all those conversations come out here. But if we take grace out of the church language box and put it back in the first century and realize that word was the commonplace word of the gift that the big man bestows to empower you know what what whatever task the lord is you know the big man has given you you know that was a grace it was a, it was a it was it was a benefit to to empower and resource you so really all that Paul is saying there, you have fallen away from that which God has given, which empowers you to do what God has created you to do. Mm. You know, it's like, you know, so you can try to do it out of your own strength. It isn't going to happen. You've you've turned away from you. You've said you you said no thanks to what the Lord wants to give in order that we can live faithfully. And of course, that's the Spirit. You know, the great gift of God is the Spirit of God because Jesus died. So so what so what Paul is describing there in in verses two through four. Is, is a condition of, well, estrangement or alienation, separation in contrast to presence, you know, and that intimacy that really is empowering because you're learning more and more to hear the, Lord vo the Lord's voice to speak encouragement and comfort and direction mm -hmm. and, you know, all those things that that really serves to empower understanding and the get to itness. And again, Zelensky, whatever dropped into Zelensky's conscience for him not to take up Biden's offer to get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever that was. I, May have, I don't think it was the Holy Spirit because, like I say, he's a secular Jew. But there is something vital that transformed that guy in the crisis. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? And for us to, to appreciate that what's at stake is that transformation that God wants to work in our lives, in our community, at that place of conscience, so that we engage, we bring all we are to the task that he's called us to. Yeah, that's good. Right. And freedom, right? That's that's freedom. Freedom to do what God has, has called us to do. Okay, so go ahead and read verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. So just to take those, you know, just the the, uh, the progression of what Paul is saying there. So for through the Spirit, okay, so that's the grace, that's the gift of God, right, that, that we stay in. For through the Spirit, by faith, faith is that, that dynamic as we experience Christ's faithfulness on the cross for us. This faith, this response is born that makes us faithful, that allegiance, okay, that's faith. Mm -hmm. you know, the natural response to God's faithfulness in Christ, faith is born, okay? So right. through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Okay, so, so the key phrase there is the hope of righteousness. And, 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 when, and when Paul uses that, he's talking about uh, the future promise of the restoration of all things. Okay, so this is the, you know, everything is set in order. God restores all things in and through us, <laughs> in and through God's people, even as we live in the middle of that Venn diagram. You know, in this present evil age, right, in the kingdom age, kingdom right, age. we are right in the middle of that, you know, where, where we're contending against the pre present evil age as we lean into uh, the kingdom age. And, and so Paul puts the future cast on that, the oh. hope of righteousness. And, right. and, and, and what he means by, the, and what he means by that is that, is that, you know, righteousness as the recognition that we truly are God's agents of redemption, God's agents of restoration. Okay. Is that uh, di, Daiku, Daikai, Sinai, you know, the... Daikai, Yeah. Okay. And Paul thankfully spells this out in Romans 8, 18 through 25. Why don't you go ahead and read that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is be, to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. There's freedom. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay, so so you see that word wait repeated three times. You you see that word hope repeated. You you captured the word freedom. Um, just nailing it down in verse twenty one. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It, it's an amazing vision that, uh, that Paul recognizes that God's plan is to restore all things in, his, in and through the sons of God, right? That's back to the, 
to this Psalm 82. Psalm 82. Ben, Benny Elohim, divine counsel thing. We are the God's agents, image bearers, exercise dominion, and creation will be fixed, will be restored as God's people respond faithfully to the Spirit's presence, empowering us to do whatever the Lord wants to do to fix the world. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, I don't got the first clue about what that is, <laughs> other than trying to get everybody to join the team and to learn how to hear his voice. See, and, and, and for Paul, see, that's, that's the hope of righteousness flowing on to verse six for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love okay the word counts for anything same word Philippians 413 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Same word that's translated counts. Yeah. That, that neither circumcision or uncirc uncircumcision counts for anything. James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to one, an one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The power of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Same word. See? Yeah. So, so, so you could translate Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus neither, circ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision can do anything, but only faith working through love. Look, circumcision, uncircumcision, that's what you do all by yourselves. And you don't need the spirit of God to cut off that foreskin as you know, to, you know, to declare that you're, you know, Jewish or whatever. Big deal. That doesn't give you the power to do anything. See, that's what he's talking about. It's not like, it's not like this is infant versus believer baptism. I mean, it's not that important. No. It's not it, it, all that yeah, stuff. We get jammed up on these things, right? And it creates distance. It, it's focusing on all that yeah. stuff creates alienation from G, for, from the living presence of Jesus because it's only faith working through love. What is faith? Faith is the dynamic of Christ's faithfulness that quickens us to full allegiance because His Spirit has filled us to love as he loves. <laughs> and that's, and the word for that is freedom. freedom. See, and that's, and that's what he's getting at. And see, and he recognizes, it man, if the Galatians fall out, fall out of the boat here, it's going to be the same old empty religious foolishness that that it, that marks this present evil age, and that's the force we hear in his argument. I mean, he's really contending here for the whole thing. Because the hope of righteousness, the only thing that's going to save this world, is God's people dwelling in the power of God's Spirit, doing what He says. See, and boy, and for us, for, you know, for us to have that vision, you know, you know, you know, for us to have that, that core, and that goes back to Genesis 1, 26. That's what was lost in Genesis 3, right? That's, you know, the, you know, the jazz theme that's being played over and over and over again, you know, and, and, and for us to, to get that, to anchor into that, to give ourselves to that, as the Lord has given himself to us. See, we all become Zelensky's as, mm. as our conscience sees with clarity driving our bodies 
to do and be different in the world. See, it's good. Praise the Lord. All right, close and get Ashley to, vol- to, to, to <laughs> practice. Dear Lord, thank you for Galatians 5, 1 through 6. Thank you uh, for the clarity of Paul's argument. Um, Lord, I confess all the ways that we would enter into um, sub-biblical, sub-spirit-filled definitions of freedom. And I ask, Lord, um, that we would walk away from those things, that we'd lay them down, and instead we would enter into this uh this trust, this promise, this power that comes only from you, um, faith working in love. Um, Let this word sink deeply in. Let it stay with us uh, over days and weeks and years and a lifetime um, until we know the fullness of your righteousness, Lord. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let let, let, Let me say hello to Ashley. Hey, Ashley, come here real quick. You got to run over. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. Everyone gets to be famous on a podcast. Right? Come on, Ashley. Come on. You're going to be a superstar. This is your moment. This is this, it. This, is. this is your entree to become an influencer. We're going to post this <laughs> oh, on Instagram, and you're Instagram. going to get millions of followers. Millions. All right. Yeah, All right. All right, guys. Thanks. Have fun. All right. Thanks for listening. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody.